And this, is, this exhibition is brought to us not by, just by John, but by Street Level Photo Works. And Malcolm Dixon is here with us tonight. We, generally speaking, have one exhibition a year from them, and we have a very fruitful, ongoing relationship. So we're looking forward to the next one. But today, and until the 4th of September, we've got John Mayer's Nobody's Home. Over to you, John. All oh, right. I, I feel guilty, like, I can't see what I'll... <laughs> Is this going to be safe? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. Um, yeah, thank, thanks for coming. It's a great turnout. And it's also, uh, it, it, street level have taken care of um, getting the prints done for this. And uh, I, I'll admit that uh, I didn't see the, uh, these actual prints until this morning. So there was a little thing in the back of my mind thinking, what if I turn up and they're dreadful? <laughs> but the, 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 um, I can't remember the name of the people in Glasgow who printed them, but they've done an absolutely fantastic job. They've turned out exactly as I'd wanted. Um, so what, yeah, what you're seeing is a faithful representation of um, the images that I took. Um, now, the, the exhibition Nobody's Home, uh, these pictures were original. well, not all of these pictures, many of them were originally exhibited back in 2013. And they've, um, they've occasionally done the rounds and they've been sort of stashed away in my workshop in uh, Leverborough on Harris for quite a while and then this opportunity to do the thing here at Dunoon cropped up. So I also took the opportunity to um, put in a few extras, uh, personal favourites of mine that have come along after the, they were first exhibited. So um, I'll give you, um, I guess, a little bit of... Have you got a string of questions that you want to ask me? Or? I, no, I'm hoping to get questions from the okay. uh, from the uh, gathering from the audience. Right. Uh, they all look very um, very keen and um, and full of glances <laughs> and full of questions. Okay. So, yeah. I'm sure. Well, I'll give a guess. bit of background to to how they came about. I suppose. Um, I first got into going around photo uh, photographing Harris about seven years after I'd actually lived there because it took me that long to figure out a way of taking photographs of the place in a way that interested me, in a way that maybe I, I hadn't seen someone do it before. And I'd always uh, been attracted to um, sort of decaying things in the landscape uh, as opposed to going out and taking pictures of the amazing beaches that we've got in Harris. Um, and it was seeing an American photographer in a TV documentary, a guy called Troy Paver. Um, he was taking pictures of um, de decaying bits and pieces like uh, trashed American diners, old 50s cars in the desert. And uh, at night, and during these long exposure images, he was using additional light he was putting into the shot um, I didn't understand how he was doing it, but I thought the images were fantastic. So I then sort of, right, I've got to get the camera out and figure out how to do like a Hebridean version of that. Um, so that resulted in me going out um, it, it, sort of within two or three days of a full moon um, to get that um, quality of light that's only available at that time of year. And of course, Harris is a great place to do that because there's most of Harris, there's, there's zero light pollution. So there are a number of pictures on here that from that period, for going, that, the one of the, um, I'm supposed to mention ones that are on this list, because we can drag them up on screen. Um, but I'll just, I'll just mention the one, like the one with the boat over there, that's sort of about one o'clock in the morning and it's a long exposure with light that I've added in. And uh, that introduced me to this whole new technique of, um, well, long exposure photography and adding in additional light. But it did become quite a frustrating process because as hooked as I was on it, the opportunities to go out and do that kind of photography were very limited because you were dependent on it being a full moon or a day or two either side of a full moon. It had to be uh, within, in the winter months because in the summer up in Harris it just doesn't get dark enough for the moonlight to really do its thing. And um, it just so happened that one night uh, when I was out and about, um, I ventured into one of the houses I was photographing and I noticed, shining my torch around, that there were loads of um, personal possessions left in the house. And I thought, well, I'm going to come back in the daylight hours and have a proper look at this. And uh, that 
was the beginning of my obsession with then traveling around the islands looking for houses like that that basically had been left empty for years and years but in many instances the the people who had left maybe they died uh, or they would moved away for some reason they had left a lot of things behind and it was that sort of um, although it was this thing about the people had gone but the, it's almost like the presence of the people was still in the house um, so the uh, first one they can call up is one called Blue Chair apparently the, the, net, the people uh, watching the live stream will be able to see that now and you'll be able to see it on the wall over there later um, it's a house in um, Harris that was uh, hardly visible from the road, it's tucked out of sight, but sort of spotted, driving around one day, spotted the just top of a roof and then went to investigate and then went into this room and there was uh, this amazing, probably 60s era blue chair in front of uh, an open fireplace and uh, between the fireplace and the chair was a one bar electric fire um, there were loads of ornaments on the mantelpiece and there was um, a 1997 calendar on the wall. There was a packet of rich tea biscuits, ex the pa well a packet, the biscuits had long disintegrated in a biscuit tin. Um, loads of um, like that, the, the cupboard in the corner that uh, my parents used to keep all the, the fancy stuff in that would only come out when the relatives came around at Christmas or New Year. They had one of those cupboards in there. And I just, just found it um, absolutely fascinating. And so it, be, it became um, it, it, like an addiction uh, of going around um, Harris initially, because I live in Harris, so it was relatively easy to travel around. And then I went started going further afield up into Lewis. And then when the notion of actually exhibiting these came about, I thought, well, I'd always been using this sort of tagline of um, an alternative view of the Outer Hebrides because I felt that I was presenting things to people about the Hebrides that you didn't normally see, you know, cue the landscapes and the beaches and the sunsets and so on. Um, but I wanted it to be an inclusive term so I thought well I've got to include the Uists as well so I ended up going down to North Uist and Ben Bekula and South Uist and Barra and ultimately Vatase is an image I'll get on to uh, later in a bit to try and cover this particular topic and um, say so initially it, I was taking these pictures just because I had gotten into photography and I wanted to pursue a particular thing and I totally got into this, had no intention of them ever, never even thought about them becoming an exhibition. Um, but um, they seemed to, they, they caught the imagination of a certain area of the media and uh, when it went on tour, people responded to them, to them really well and you know, we're, we're nine years on now and we're still, it's, I don't know, it's like I'm in a you know, one-hit wonder. It keeps coming back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully in 10 years' time, I'll be back showing a different batch of pictures that everybody will really like as well. Um, so uh, moving on to the next one for the, the live stream people um, is one called uh, Green Room. And this is um, actually it's a house in North Uist that I'd spotted um, again, way, way off the road. You couldn't actually drive to this house, so it was a case of parking up and walking across uh, boggy stuff, climbing over barbed wire fences and stuff to get access to it. Turns out that the house um, probably explains one of the reasons why the thing had been abandoned. The guy in it had died, um, and uh, the access, the original access to the house was by, by boat. Um, so, you know, even if it was fit for renovation, it was never, in today's, you know, it's not going to happen today. So it was just left. And uh, in, in, the, in that image, there's, um, I can do it from memory, there's a sheep carcass. Obviously, the, one of the doors gaining access to the house had caved in. Sheep were able to wander in. Sheep had come in there, decided to die on top of a pile of 12-inch um, records. Um, <laughs> There was, <laughs> it was mostly Scottish pipe bands, oh. if that makes it any better. Mm. Was a critic. That's, that's kind of a gesture though, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> but that, that particular room also had what many of the houses uh, have as well, is the 
old Rayburn stove, which was kind of like the heart of many, many Hebridean homes. I know a lot of when, certainly when I exhibited these down in um, uh, Cumbria, I uh, could hear people, men whenever they mentioned it, they were always mentioning the word Arga, which kind of found really annoying and had to resist the earth. <laughs> it's not a bloody Arga, it's, <laughs> it's a Rayburn. Um, and there is what, the, apparently some of the, if the people were feeling a bit more well-to-do, the, the next notch up from a Rayburn was a stove called the Modern Mistress. <laughs> and there is, there is one right down the end of the room on this wall. There's, um, there's a house with a modern mistress, which... <laughs> I, I have to say, when I, when I was putting up the labels, I was going through a list, so I had all the labels provided by Stray Love and all. Modern mistress? Yeah, it's what some of this stuff that? sounds a bit weird, but you know, it, it's, you can actually read the, lo I checked before, yeah. you can read the logo, it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, cast into it's the, the, from, the, the modern the mistress. I'm not Something sure when that stove would have originally been bought, certainly, I don't know if it would be, it wouldn't, probably not that early, I reckon, oh. no, probably 50s, 60s. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, those things lasted for ages. Uh, and the, 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 then, as, as the pictures got more well known, and then, well, one of my, uh, when I say favourite, I mean it in an ironic way, um, there, there was um, a whole bunch of them were shared on the Daily Mail online website. And the hilarious thing was the stream of comments that followed below. There was like two, well, I haven't checked it in years, but it was like 295 comments. And a lot of them were just... Um, moronic as you'd expect um, but you know it's saying it's an absolute crime that these houses have been left to rot and so on but the thing is that um, many of the houses that I have photographed they, they even with the best will in the world they wouldn't be fit to, for somebody to try and renovate they just they wouldn't be up to it you know they might be built on a, literally on a bog or over a stream um, and there's there's, um, there's one in particular um, the green, it's not the green room, it's, um, well the one I mentioned first, the blue chair, that, ha that house, when I, f when I first went into it, the ceiling was actually, actually consisted of wallpaper on top of hard sheets of hardboard and one of the sheets of hardboard had actually dropped down and I did, I actually moved that one out of the way because it was blocking, you know, part of what I wanted to photograph. And one, when you actually then looked up in the gap where the, the hardboard had fallen down, you could see the corrugated tin roof. And then, of course, bits of that had rotted through and you could literally three, see, see through to the sky. So you just think that um, the, the people who lived in those houses, particularly in the winter months, it was, must have been absolutely freezing. So this thing of having the Rayburn stove, was um, that would be getting piled up with peats. They'd be burning peats all the time to try and, try and heat the place. They'd do their cooking on the Rayburn. They'd, um, we mentioned this earlier this morning, we were chatting to someone, you know, they'd, if there was an orphaned lamb and it needed warming up, the, little, the, the Rayburn's got a little thing, drop down thing where you pop the lamb in there for five minutes to warm it up. Or if you'd been out in the soaking rain, got soaked, you put your boots in there to dry them out. You know, the Rayburn was literally the heart of the home. Presumably a bit longer if you wanted to eat the lamb. <laughs> Yeah, Dad, yeah, a few vegetarians on Harris yeah, now. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. apologies to any vegans in the audience. Yeah. Um, so the, then I'll, for the next image, um, it's called Bedroom and Chapel, and um, that'll probably pop up on screen uh, shortly. And um, this is not... The, this is a little bit different to most of the houses that are photographed because it's, um, it's quite a grand house that uh, dates back to the 1800s and it was um, something to do with um, a, uh, a, fac a factor who, you know, chased people off the land, you know, to, off the west side of Harris to put sheep on it and they, they put the poor peasants over on the rocky east side where I now live. Um, <laughs> And this, this uh, is on an uninhabited island in the Sound of Harris. It's about, it's about a mile uh, off the south end of Harris, a call, an island called Ense, and the house is called Ense House. And I got the opportunity to go over there one day and get inside. And um, the, um, you can see on the left-hand side of the wall there, there's like a, a bell thing that you would ring to summon the servants because there's actually there was servants quarters in that house um, 
uh, but the thing that attracted me to taking that particular image was the idea of um, have got these amazing old um, probably be very expensive doors nowadays and so I deliberately jammed the door open because it was tending to come back on me um, with a bit of junk I found on the floor so it's this sense of looking into the room but at the same time looking out of it as well through the window to what is a small chapel uh, you can see through the window and the, the little chapel there is um, there's a, a group of people, they call themselves the Friends of Ense, and what they do, uh, they organise a, a trip out to Ense each year with a minister, and um, they hold a service in there, and it's a, it's a thing that makes it possible for the, the, the little chapel to be officially recognised as a religious um, you know, venue, or where, I don't know what the correct terminology of that is. Um, sort of, you know, a religious ceremony, sort of perhaps coming out to the, the chapel. Um, I mean, it's sort of intercede. It's very painterly. I'm very captivated by how the graininess and how much it looks. Yeah, painterly. well, that, again, that is another thing that I suppose, um, well, a few, lots of things that appeal to me about taking the pictures in the first place. I suppose, firstly, it was that thing of it finding so many personal belongings left mm. behind. Because, like I said to you earlier, you know, the, the, I'm a lad from Manchester. If a place got left abandoned for, like, half an hour, <laughs> <laughs> it would be gone or trashed. Whereas these have been, a majority of these, these have yeah. been empty for probably, you know, decades. Yeah. And the, the only thing that's caused any damage is that nature is taking its toll on them. I mean, ultimately what happens is when it gets as bad as the, once the roof gives way, of course it comes in and it trashes everything. So I think I was fortunate in that um, these, uh, funny way of putting it, I suppose, but I think I've managed to capture them. I was just lucky enough to capture them at the right time. But there's a certain amount of decay has taken place over a period of time, yet it's not so drastic that it's completely ruined it. Because um, some of these now have, were taken, you know, getting on for 10 years ago. And some, some of the houses that you see on the walls here now don't exist anymore. They've either literally fallen to bits or in some cases been demolished to make way for a new build. Uh, so there's always also that, I suppose, it's quite a nice element that they've been documented, yeah. you know. Um, I mean, they, they look as if you've, you've just gone in there and photographed them as they are. I've been looking quite carefully for signs of composition and maybe thinking that you've you know, move things around a bit, but I, I don't think you probably have, or no, if get, you have, very little. I do, I do get asked that because some some people are really suspicious that you, that's com yeah. been completely manipulated. Now, the, there's in the vast majority of instances, they literally, as you say, you turn up, you see, I see what you see in front of you, and then it's just a case of me composing the image to frame it in a way that I feel suits it best. There was um, uh, the, the one with the blue chair in that I mentioned earlier, the sheet of hardboard had fallen down and it was draped on top of the, the um, uh, cabinet full of ornaments. So I just, I did drag that out of the way. Uh, and then there was, um, there's another one in, um, I haven't asked uh, John to call this one up, but it's, I call it the dog, the cat and the bird. And the, 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 the title came to me when I was looking at the image on the computer because there's um, that, that picture's further down the wall there. Um, again, it's a, a no, looking straight on, uh, yet yeah, another Rayburn stove. And then on the mantelpiece above, there's a picture of a dog. And it's one of those, um, I suppose, th again, this is part of the thing why these things appeal to me. It's, um, it's a really tacky looking picture. It's about this big and it's like a blown plastic. So it's a th almost three dimensional. I don't know if you, old enough to remember yeah i remember going down looking for a birthday present for my mum i was about 10 or 11 and i had a bit of pocket money i thought i'd buy my mum a birthday present and go down the road to the local hardware shop and they had some of these 3d pictures in the window and i thought they were the most amazing thing i had ever seen i didn't have enough money to buy it but i i do still remember it and of course i go in this house and there's this 
um, it's like a lassie, looks like lassie. Yeah. There's yeah. that dog uh, on the mantelpiece in this 3D plastic thing. And then on the opposite side of the mantelpiece, there's one of a kitten. The same thing. And there's a dog and a cat. And then the weird thing is that I was setting up to get the picture. And I, I didn't position them. That's where, the, the, where they were. In fact, the, cat, the cat's on the left and the dog's on the right. So if I'd been into fiddling, I would have put the dog on the left. So it would be the dog. <laughs> right. Um, but when I was t setting up to take the picture, um, the house had been, in, like most of these, had been empty for quite some time. And uh, I was setting up the tripod and jiggling the position. That I noticed there was a little skeleton of a bird about this big on the floor, right at the foot of the tripod. So I'm looking through the viewfinder and I'm hoping I could get the bird in the shot as well, but it wasn't. But I did, I cheated and I gave it a little flick with my foot and it slid in towards the Rayburn. And it's either, if, if you look at the shot you, uh, carefully, you will see the little bird. So it gave me the, the dog, the cat I and the bird. I think we can put that under artistic license. Yes. <laughs> but also, it do, that one in particular, it does look, a, it, I'll, I'll admit it does look a bit set up. It's like this scene of decay. You've got this, the tacky picture of the dog and the cat, the little dead birds on the floor. Um, there's a wooden spoon on the wall that says, uh, written on it, you're never too old to spoon. <laughs> 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 and um, there's, a, there's also a framed picture propped up on the mantelpiece in the middle in between the dog and the cat and it's a picture of a boat and we know that the guy that used to live in the house was, uh, he was in the navy, he was a, sea, a merchant seaman or whatever uh, so hence the picture of the boat I guess but it must have been left for some time with um, in, in the sunlight with something draped over it because half of it was faded and half of it wasn't. And then there's also this really quite fancy um, green um, bowl. Like, you know when you watch them cowboy movies and they, they have a, a, a basin and a big bowl to put the water in? It's like one of those things. And it did look a bit set up. And then I, I discovered uh, that about a week before I took my picture, there'd been a group of French photography students staying at a bunkhouse just up the road and they had been spotted going in to this house and I guess they had done a little bit of manoeuvring around but uh, you know I guess I took advantage of what they'd done and also in amongst all the um, detritus and decay also propped up on the mantelpiece was a copy of uh, Good Housekeeping magazine from 1989. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, not evident in most of these photographs, but... Uh. Um, so there's a, the next one for the screen is uh, called TV Set, which is right beside me here. Yeah. Um, and this is um, uh, a house on Scalpy, Isle of Scalpy, which is, you can now access by... It's just a little drive over a bridge to get to Scalpy. And... Um, yeah, the, it was actually uh, a friend of mine who, who when we did the, f the first ever ex exhibition of, these, of some of these images, it was a joint exhibition with a guy called um, Ian Patterson. Mm -hmm. And Ian, he was sharing his pictures with me because he got in touch and said, I've been doing similar stuff to you. And he sent me a picture. He'd been in this house and, and uh, very similar looking pictures to this. And I, I was really, I, the, I think it's the TV that sold it to me for some reason. I said, you've got to tell me where that is because I'm going to go and do my version of that. So, of course, I head off to Scalpy and uh, I take that picture, which this, this just looks to me like there's been an atom bomb test. And the, whoever was sat in that chair watching the TV got vaporised except for one boot. Um, and then the, the, um, probably a few, it was a few months after this, I'd taken this picture, I got a phone call from someone I know on Harris who said... I've just seen something that might interest you. It looks up your street. Uh, there's an old television set being dumped on the pavement outside the Harris Hotel in Tarbert. So, of course, I went to have a look, and it was still there on the pavement. And I thought, well, it's a shame to see it getting junked, you know. It's clearly not going to work, but um, I'll take it back down the workshop and just keep hold of it for now, figure out something at some point. Um, and it was only when um, later in the day I, I was looking at the telly back down at work and um, I thought, um, I hadn't clicked at first that it might be this TV set. So I opened up the images I'd taken and blew them up and so on and zoomed in and checked the telly. It's, 
it's actually the TV. Someone's taken the, this TV set out of this house, which really annoyed me because I, I hate the idea of like, you know, the whole thing is you go in and I, all I'm doing, I'm taking pictures, I'm not taking anything else out of the house and I don't think anybody else should either. But um, coincidentally, it was probably, it might have been about a year later, I got a call from um, a producer who was working on uh, what was going to be a TV programme on BBC Alaba about um, corrugated tin houses. And they done a bit of, you know, Googling or whatever, and they found I photographed stuff like that. And they asked me, would I be prepared to, could I nominate a house and go along and we'll do a little piece about it. And I came up with this genius idea that this would be my opportunity to reunite this television set back to where it belonged. <laughs> so that form, that became like a little sort of five, ten minute thing in the programme about bringing the TV. And the, the, guy, the, the guy who was presenting the programme, it's good as footage of me and him carting it back in and putting it back in there. And then skip forward another few months and then I'm on the uh, thing called the, the Butty Bus, which is like a, a mobile calf. And it's just across the road from my workshop. And uh, there was a guy on there that I knew with another fellow. And he says, have you ever met, met Finlay before? And I says, no. So he introduced me to him. And he, he, uh, and he said, Finlay is the, um, he was a relation, a nephew, I think, of the woman who used to live in this house. And I said, wow, we just did a TV. Did you see the thing on TV, you know, where we brought the telly back and all that? And he says, no. So I, I spent about the next five minutes telling him the long convoluted story about how the TV programme came about and that, you know, wasn't I great for bringing this television set back and reuniting it where it belonged. And um, he just let me waffle on. And then eventually he said, that's really strange. My auntie never had electricity. <laughs> I have no idea. I think it was too impressive. It's probably because people had better imaginations in those days. So you're like, look at it. I mean, I'm, I do the same with the radio. I prefer the radio because the pictures are better. But then it, it went a little bit further because um, I posted this on my website and probably, you know, social media sort of thing. And I, um, I, shortly afterwards, I got a phone call from somebody that, I think it was the Daily Telegraph. And uh, he'd been, obviously been doing his lazy jur investigative journalism via Google. <laughs> and um, there'd been a report issued that the highest, the, uh, the, the, they were stating the number of people in the UK that still had a black and white TV license and that the highest proportion was in the Outer Hebrides. So he must have put TV set out to Hebrides and then he come found my photo and then rings me and it's, I, he wanted to, me to put him onto someone that still watched black and white TV. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought, uh, been a bit, uh, yeah, I thought, well, I'll just, I asked around, I asked around, I tried, I asked around and then somebody told me, he says, that, that's, that's absolute nonsense. They might have a black and white TV license, but they ain't got a black and white TV. Because <laughs> uh, it saves you over 100 quid. Fra yeah. Frankly, I was surprised I had a TV license, because you, you'd see the van coming, wouldn't you? Well, the, the, then the, the, somebody then told me that, you know, of course, when they used to send the, 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 uh, those, uh, va you know, the vans with all the contraptions on the top that were going to come and get you mm. if you... Um, they board the ferry at Ullapool or, or uh, in Skye. Someone on the ferry straight away is on the, the Bush Telegraph. Yeah. They come in. You know, hide. hide them. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, so that probably got yeah. loaned around loads yeah. of houses in Harris. Yeah. That I think, yeah, we've yeah. got black and white TV. Yeah. <laughs> They're not daft. Um, right, so... Yeah, there's a five images we've got here to, to call up for the, the live streamers. And the last one is uh, taken in Ui, uh, little village, U-I-D-H. I think Ui is how you pronounce it. It's in Vatasay, and Vatasay is the um, southernmost inhabited island in the uh, Outer Hebrides. It's connected via a short causeway to Barra. And uh, again, another name check for Ian Patterson, who did the original um, uh, exhibition with... Uh, he, the first ever contact I had with Ian was he said, I've, I've seen your pictures, really like them, I like to come over, to, he, he's from Fife, he, I like to come over to the Outer Hebrides when I can, and it, he's into similar, very similar sort of pictures. 
and he'd taken a picture of these two gable ends in um, Uy, in Vatase, and said, this would, I think this would really suit your treatment. So I've been keeping it in mind since I first had contact with Ian. Um, and then in 2017, I was over in um, uh, Barra, uh, and I thought, right, I'm in Barra, I'm going to search out this um, place, uh, these two gable ends in Vatase. And uh, so I went down and found it, and I, I uh, had this little concept of how to do it, because I've, obviously I've used additional light in that shot. Um, but um, the, yeah, the, the, it, earlier that day, I'd been in the main town in Castle, uh, Castle Bay in Barra, and I, one of the buildings that I'd been on a job to photograph was the big church there. Uh, big Catholic church. So I'd gone in the church and on the side just of the entrance where you go they had copies of the um, Catholic newspaper and uh, the, the, page, the picture on the front page was um, a, a photograph of a hearse with a coffin inside on the beach at uh, Barra because uh, many of you probably know that the airport at Barra you, the plane comes in it's a spectacular looking thing the plane comes in lands on the beach and of course what had happened, I think I was there in June uh, 2017, earlier that year, a few months earlier, there'd been the Manchester Arena bombing and uh, a 15 year old girl from Barra had been at the concert and she, she was killed in that explosion. And the, this picture of the coffin in the hearse was her, she'd been returned to Barra that very week. And um, so you got this, uh, it's a bit... Um, so I, I, she got killed in Manchester and then I was in Barra, where she was from, and then I was presented with this place of, you know, putting the lights back on in that house. So I'm, I'm going to stop on that one there. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's why that's a personal favourite for me, because it brings back a lot of that, that thing. So I don't know how long... I can, I can tell more about the images, or I don't know whether you want to get into uh, Q&A. Another one. <laughs> we just did a radio thing. I'm wondering if you, obviously you touched on it a little bit because you would find out the story behind the people that lived in these abandoned houses. Did you find out most of them or did you, ah, right, did you want yeah. to or did you want them just left as, as kind of to speak for themselves? Right. The, I never, I didn't I try to find out any information in advance. I just wanted to go out and very sort of a bit stealth like go in and get these photographs. Um, but then as they became more known, there, there were people actually were getting in contact that um, had, you know, the, they knew about the house or their relations used to own it, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I did get to hear stories about many of these, or if I've already shared some stories about mm -hmm. them, I mean, I got to hear about them after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, yeah, there's one, it's this one right here, actually, this oh. house. Um, I'd taken a, a, a number of photographs in that house and um, I'd shared them, I've written a thing up about it and I pe featured them on my website. And the, um, I think I'd posted them up on like on a Saturday night. And Monday morning there was a phone call and it was this woman asking to speak to me. So I, uh, and, she, and she explained that her sister had seen the pictures and she'd got on and told her to go and check them out. And it turns out, I, th I can't remember the exact relationship, I think it was their grandparents house and um, she started off by saying that she was found the images quite upsetting mm. so I, I offered to pull them off you know think I, what and while I was saying that I was also saying thinking right, well I hope she doesn't because I, I like them mm. <laughs> and then she says no no it's, I don't want you to take them off it's just I, I'll tell you why I find them upsetting and then she went on to explain you know the, the, the stuff about the house and it's a weird one where um, the, when the uh, people who were living in it had died, um, the house had got left to the, uh, the eldest in the family, in other words, her, I think it was her older sister. And uh, the eldest, that, well, that's a traditional thing to do. Uh, but she wasn't living on the island anymore. She was, I'm not sure if she was abro uh, abroad or maybe on the, certainly on the mainland at least, uh, with 
the intention of one day coming back and uh, doing something with the house. But of course, the the intention never often never comes about, and the, the house just sits there. But the, I suppose the awkward thing about this was that there were relatives from the family still on the island, witnessing the gradual decay of this place turning into nothing. And it actually to the point that it caused a bit of a, a rift in the family, and uh, you know, so you can see why mm -hmm. there was there was upset. And it it taught me a, a kind of a lesson, I think, in that. Um, I like to think that, um, you, I mean, it'd be very easy to say that actually going into these houses, I should say I've never broken into one, it's only because the access was, it was you, you could just go in through the door, it's not a problem. <coughs> but it is kind of, uh, I guess, a voyeuristic sort of thing to do, uh, photographing people's personal blogs, even if they're long dead. Mm. Um, but the, the but, but trying to do it in a respectful way, which is difficult to, I don't know if that comes up, you, how can you convey that in, in the pictures? But hopefully that does come across because that was the intention behind them. Mm. Also, you've captured them before they, they were too decayed. You can still see when that had been lived in. You can imagine, you know, like a paint here. And of course, a lot of them, within a few years, the roof's gone. And as you say, everything's gone once the rain comes in. Yeah, yeah. And there's one, there's one down the back there. It's called, um, what did I, I called it, waiting room. Um, it's, it's also been a bit of a history lesson of the islands for me as well because not only have I learned more about the islands as a result of taking the pictures and then hearing direct stories from people associated with these buildings but you get to see uh, in a way it's a little bit like a glimpse into the way fashions in interior design have gone on the island because there's, um, there's some of the, the, the kind of still the basic ones that have got the wooden V lining, that, the one called the green room that was flagged up earlier. And uh, the, what, there's one with a, a clock on a brightly coloured yellow wall. So I've got to, make, got to mention something about the, the, the colours of the interiors as well, because many of the houses outwardly actually look quite dour, uh, a bit drab. Um, uh, it's because these things have to withstand horrendous weather conditions so the priority is not to make it look like some designer thing on the outside it has to withstand the weather so you've got that you know the harling on the outside and all that kind of thing but uh, it really surprised me when I first went into one uh, I was presented with this room that was like a um, like a lemon yellow walls and it matched the Rayburn the Rayburn was a yellow one and then there's um, the two pictures down the, on the end wall, they're, they're both taken in the same house. Now you see the door, the, the, the Rayburn is like a, a baby blue colour and they've painted the door in kind of like a baby blue as well. So it's like there's, there's some thought gone into it. But the other, the other mad thing about that I thought, and it, it was only pointed out to me by someone who came along to an exhibition, I hadn't even realised it weirdly at first, that um, that house has been wallpapered and the wallpaper is wood effect wallpaper and because it's been on so long it's starting to peel away and you can clearly see underneath the wood effect wallpaper is wood, <laughs> <laughs> the real thing, it's weird. <laughs> And there's one, there's one house, um, it's, not, it's not featured in here, it's just, it was just down the road from uh, our house. And um, a similar thing, it's the wooden V lining, but at some point, um, you know, it must have become fashionable. I'm guessing it must have been around about 19, the mid-60s uh, that it became fashionable to not just have your V lining, it was much cooler and hipper to have uh, wallpaper. So, but what many of them did was rather than wallpaper directly onto the wood, they would f first of all get old newspapers and paste them on for, as like an under, um, what do you call it, lining paper. And of course a lot of the wallpaper had peeled off and I found myself in there for like a good couple of hours reading bits of the newspapers and there was, new, there was, a, there was a couple of newspapers on there that I'd never even heard of before. Um, I can't remember the name of them now, uh, but long gone. And the, of course the dates are on the wallpaper, so that presumably, unless they were into hoarding old newspapers, that, that their, their spate of decorating took place in between 64 and 66. Just let them with the mic. Uh. Hi. Um, have you got any um, urge to go to other islands and do more photography of 
of deserted, abandoned buildings or even parts of the mainland? I have, no, not really. Um, I mean, as a result of having done these, um, of course, I thought I'd stumbled across something really unique. But it then, you know, as people got, more people got to see them, there's, um, I can't remember, remember the name of the photographer, but there was a guy in um, Southern Ireland that had gone, had got a whole collection of pictures very, in a similar vein to this. And, uh, but his has some, have something that is completely missing from these. And that's um, a lot of Catholic imagery, you know, which um, the, I mean, my, but I'm of Southern Irish descent, both parents were born in Southern Ireland, Catholic, Roman Catholics, I was brought up as that. And uh, we had in our, uh, live, the, we, we didn't call it the living room back then, it was the middle room. Um, you had a picture of uh, Jesus with um, this weird bulb, um, I think I think they use the same picture. I've seen it in Father Ted, uh, and the, the, yeah, that that, all, that that Catholic stuff. So it, I, I realise that it, it's not it's not unique, but I think it's probably specific to rural areas because if it was more city type, you, the, well, the, all the stuff would get taken away, nicked or trashed or whatever. So um, and then somebody. Uh, did a, a radio interview a few years ago with somebody for a, a radio station in Atlanta and then he showed me a bunch of images of where people have gone round photographing old abandoned houses around there so there's that's like the southern American version so no I, I, feel, I think I feel I have an attachment with these just by virtue of living there and I feel like I've got a little bit of inside knowledge to it whereas I think if I went to another country doing it, I just I feel like a bit of a tourist, and I don't want these to look like tourist images, if that makes any sense. These are not just I just get the um, microphone. Oh, <laughs> these are not just time exposures, are they? I mean, there's a lot of artistic lighting taking uh, place. Yeah, many, many of the shots have got additional lighting in. I mean, some of it's fairly obvious, particularly the night photography stuff. And uh, the one I mentioned there about the two gable ends, where I've, I've lit that in such a way as to make it look like the lights were on inside a house that basically no longer exists. Um, but there are several, because uh, there was a bunch of these images that I actually shot on a large format film camera. Uh, because, well, there's a sort of long technical reason for that. It's basically because I wanted to create really large prints of like really high quality um, and the, all of those are, are shot just literally with the natural daylights literally just one pop of the shutter they might be eight seconds long 15 seconds long max but uh, um, let me think uh, the Did ones extra lighting in that? not in that no no wow. that's marvelous <laughs> Uh, that was shot on a digital camera, so I, met, I was able to lift the shadows a bit, you know, and do those little tweaks. But there's no, there's certainly no, um, I mean, anybody shooting digital photos is using, generally using Photoshop to produce them because that's the equivalent of a darkroom. But not Photoshop in the sense that it's been manipulated and tricked about with, no. Mm, marvellous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thomas, yeah, please. Uh, speaking about film cameras, what camera did you use and what particular film stock did you use for most of the photos? Oh, technically, technical, uh, technical. I right, it was a, it was a four inch by five inch uh, negative that I used. The camera's a Cinar Norma. Um, I don't know if that means anything to you. It was basically when, when I discovered that there was a potential to shoot on, um, on a large format negative, because you've got to remember, like, even in the most expensive digital camera, the sensor's probably that big. Uh, Whereas with film, you, well, you could go 8 by 10 is 8 inch by 10 inch, but mine was 4 by 5. And I saw this American guy, a, a different American photographer to the one I mentioned originally, a guy called Michael Eastman. Um, doing photographs of abandoned places around America with an 8x10 film camera getting the, this 8x10 negative effectively treating that 8x10 negative as a digital sensor by having it the negative scanned at really high resolution 
And as long as your technique in taking the picture is good, then the, the information captured within that negative is there to be extracted out. And by scanning it um, at high res, you can then create these really massive, very, very detailed images. So I, could, I didn't go down the 8x10 route, that was a step too far, I went 4x5. And because uh, at the time, in, to do it digitally, I would have had to spend about £20,000 on a medium format digital camera. That was not an option. What I did was I got a large format film camera off eBay for 210 quid, And then I got a lens, another lens for 195 quid, And then I bought a bunch of books, old books, to learn how to use it. And then um, went out and tentatively like, set up and shot these images, sent them away to be developed. I got them back. I scanned the negatives on my own scanner and converted them to positive to see if they were any good. And, and, and the weird thing is, out of 10, photo, 10 negatives, I had seven that were users. Like the, the hit rate, because you take, because it's like, it's about 10 quid a sheet now. I was, it was costing me, I think, about £6 for a sheet of film. So before you click the shutter, you make sure you've set everything up right. So I had to send that away, get it developed, scan it. I think this is a goer. I then sent that negative away to be scanned professionally at high res, which cost 25 quid per image. The image came back on a memory stick, and each image was nearly a gigabyte in size. So I got the memory stick in a post, got home, put it in the computer, opened it up, I thought, well, I'll just do a tiny little contrast change to it. That's all. Otherwise, it's just like amazing as it is. And my computer went weird because it was crunching away trying to process this image. And I left it overnight. I thought it would be done in the morning. And I got up in the morning, went into that room where the computer was, and it just all crashed and that. So I'd bought an old, a 1960s film camera to shoot this piece of film. And I now had to buy a brand new compo computer <laughs> to be able to do anything with it. And it was a great lesson because it, I think what it, what it showed to me is that as fantastic as digital photography is because it's just massively convenient and it's, there's a lot of things I can do with digitally that I wouldn't attempt to do with a film camera. But the same thing's true looking the other way around as well. If I today got a project in mind where I wanted to produce really big prints of gallery, you know, we'd be coming out again. It's, it's so, you know, film, film's going to be with us for a good while. It's got, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like, I, 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 I always find myself equating quite a lot of things photography-wise with, because uh, I have a track record of sorts in the music dis business. This, this, with vinyl, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like film's not dead, vinyl's not dead yet. Um, and it, but the, the thing is, I suppose some people might go the vinyl route because they feel it's trendy. I'm looking at the film, not because it's a cool thing, and I shoot film, but there are distinct advantages for particular purposes. It's, it's got advantages over digital to me still. So like, yeah, use best of both worlds job. I'm trying to frame this question. Um, I'm just going to stream of consciousness. I find these fascinating, um, particularly the interior shots. But I'm not a photographer, so I'm interested in your process. When I walk into a space like that, I'll be picking up the atmosphere and trying to imagine who lived there and you know whatever I can sense. But when you're going in there, are you actually thinking about how to frame it, how long the exposure? You're thinking in technical okay, terms yeah. of how to... So you're approaching it from a completely different, more, more a technical well, point yeah, of view? Yeah, you do, you do sort of take on some sort of vibe, whether it's of the past thing that Oh, totally, yeah, yeah. It's quite, uh, sometimes quite a weird experience. Some of them do have an eeriness to them. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm sitting here, obviously, with these ones closest. I'm finding them endlessly fascinating. But I'll, I'll take advantage of what you asked. As in terms of, because um, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, architectural photography, which generally speaking is like, if you imagine people, uh, a new building has been commissioned and it gets built and it's some design, proper designer -y job thing. And they'll get a photographer to go and photograph it and the, 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 they'll make sure that all the verticals are perfectly vertical. And it's a, it's a technical process to shoot something like that properly. 
And I, because I like that, I'm a big fan of that style of photography, I actually sort of, in my, my way, I've taken that and I've applied it to these interiors, which although they might like this thing, you know, a bit ramshackle, it's falling apart. But I've ta taken the time, the camera, I don't want to bore people with too much technical information, but setting things up um, and, and um, making sure that... Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Somebody asked me to critique their images of an old mining town in America that they'd gone to because they'd seen my photographs and they'd t told me that they'd been. And they said, be honest. So I looked at the images and it was clear to me that what they'd done is they wandered inside the, these old miners' huts and the, uh, they just put the camera up to their eye. Uh, they were st clearly st hadn't crouched down or anything like that or used a tripod and just took the picture. So everything was from the viewpoint of them. So pr pretty much because they were little small shed type things, they were looking down at things. And when you look down at things with a wide angle lens in particular, the, the vertical lines, assuming they, 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 in real life they're vertical, like the, the edges of the walls, they were doing this. And I, I'm a, probably a bit OCD about that. And as soon as I spot that in, a, in, a, in an architectural photo, that's all I can see. I can't see anything else in the picture. So all of these, if anybody can pick fault in it, um, you're welcome to have a go. But I've tried to... Um, uh, the, the camera is meticulously positioned so that none of that is going on. The camera's dead level. And I see that, and this, this in a way, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about treating these places with respect. I'm thinking, well, when the houses were originally built, the person who building it, presumably they'll have been using a spirit level or be doing something to make sure that's level and that's level. And I just thought, well, I'm, at least I can do is try and present it in the way that they tried to build it, if you like. Now, I don't, I'd, I'd imagine probably a lot of people, that's, too, that's boring, you just want to see the image. But I do think that that process does lend a, some sort of, like, it's almost like putting a kind of order into um, the, well, it's not chaos, but the, the decay, you know, it's yeah. trying to present it really, really neatly and precisely, if that makes sense. paintings yeah. or have that kind of fear and paradoxically the, the reason for that is because you've got the perspective lines dead right which is what an artist uh, would do yeah that's interesting because i haven't thought yeah, about because that, that's what yeah. i thought about that yeah. i mean you know the, the the perspective lines of that are all tending to you know a vanishing point just beyond yeah. that church yeah and similarly this one here and that's why i couldn't work it out right yeah, yeah. It's the, well, yeah, because I suppose, yeah, if you, were, if you had a blank sheet of paper and you were asked to draw a room, you're not going to draw the walls at wonky angles. And, or, you know, like when you're looking up at a building and people take pictures of built, looking up at a building, they, they tend to go like that. Well, you don't, I don't do that. Um, so that's my attempt at trying to put that kind of, so I, 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 I like that, yeah. questioned out okay right well we're about that time anyway so say thank you to John thank you, thank you. Thank you.